I'm Ahead of the Curve, also known as James Bergman, and in today's book review, I will be discussing Maurice Malou Ponty's The World of Perception, first published in 1948. Malou Ponty was one of the most creative philosophers of the 20th century. He combined a new way of thinking about the structures of human life with reflections on art, literature, and politics, which draw on this new philosophy. Malou Ponty is best known as being a phenomenologist. For those who do not know what phenomenology is, it's essentially the study of experience and consciousness. It is a philosophical and psychological uh, mode of investigation of reality. These lively radio talks from 1948 show him at the height of his powers, moving easily between philosophical themes and discussions of painting and politics the emphasis on painting is indeed especially notable here, as is the way in which he uses this to indicate his philosophical themes. The result is a brief text which provides the best possible introduction to his philosophy, especially since this is dominated by a larger and more complex text published in 1945, Phenomenology of Perception, which, by the way, I have reviewed on this channel before. I'm sure some of you have already seen it. I would check that out, especially to read it and to watch the review. As text here says, it is a very, very difficult book to read and extremely dense, but very much worth it uh, at that same time. Uh, but these talks should be also valued in their own right, for in many respects, the contrasts with the past which Malou Ponty draws and the anxieties which he articulates are still ours. As mentioned in what I just read out from the introduction of this piece, which, by the way, is really, really useful in understanding uh, the writings in the piece, the series of lectures, which this is what the book is, essentially. It's a series of lectures which were originally recorded on uh, French radio in uh, 19, the, the 1940s. And so they were compiled eventually in this book, The World of Perception. The publisher of my particular edition is Rosalige, which I love their covers. You guys know that from a few of my book reviews now, I have now found another book edition that I really, really enjoy, which is uh, Rosalige. They generally publish more academic works. Yeah, the, the front covers are always a bit trippy or a bit strange. Uh, yeah, th this one is particularly... Uh, relevant to what's in the book as far as I'm concerned. So what this review is going to entail is essentially an explanation and analysis of each lecture that he gave within the book. I will be going fairly in depth so I don't actually know how long this video might be but I'll try and be as succinct and concise but as thorough as I can and so I hope you enjoy this video. I spent a lot of time uh, writing and thinking and uh, interpreting this book and it's a very short book at that. And so, yeah, I wanted to make sure that this was a very worthwhile review to make. Uh, a lot like my Phenomenology of Perception book review by uh, Malou Ponty. I wanted this one as well to be worth the viewer's time, so to speak. Lecture one, the world of perception and the world of science. In this lecture, Maurice Malou Ponty goes a bit in the past. He talks about previous conceptions of reality and truth and how uh, thinkers have come to interpret reality and what is true uh, and also the scientific method. So he talks a bit about that and he goes to Descartes, who of course famously said, I think, therefore I am, meaning that all we can know truly is that we have thoughts and therefore we exist. Uh, although personally I do not agree with this, I think that all we know is that there are thoughts. We don't know if we have a genuine self or not. I mean, that's the main criticism of Descartes, that he assumed that human beings had a self. And instead, as far as I'm concerned, and many other, um, you know, many scholars and philosophers also believe that he went a bit too far in that regard, because to uh, know that we have a self assumes that we have ultimate free will, which is a very contentious topic, uh, to say the very least. Malou Ponty's primary point in this first lecture is to suggest that we shouldn't be too optimistic of the scientific method in regard to it telling us everything to know about the world and reality and especially subjective perception. The introduction very well highlights this, this point, which I'll read out for you now. Malou Ponty makes it clear that he does not contest the value of scientific inquiry. What he does reject is the thought that science penetrates to the heart of things, to the object as it is in itself. 
Instead, he holds science provides only abstract representations of aspects of the world that are of technological value, but which do not constitute absolute and complete knowledge. It seems that the fundamental difference between Descartes and Meloponti in their philosophy is that Descartes believed that everything about reality is a mere vague approximation, whereas Meloponti believed that we could have a sense of reality which is down to the a priori uh, perceptions that we might have calculated from our brain. So, in other words, Meloponti was more optimistic about how much we can know about reality, whereas Descartes was uh, ultimately and the ultimate sceptic. Meloponti goes on to reference Descartes' idea of wax, and he follows up on this by saying that whilst wax is a physical object that we can feel and that we can experience, he believes it's also, uh, in, in some regard, a, an abstract object, because at the same time of physically experiencing wax, you know, moulding it um, and the different forms it can take, it's not so much an object that we can be entirely uh, objective about, more so that it's a abstract of reality that changes, right? Because wax can change its form. Uh, you know, it's, it's, at the end of the day, always a fundamental physical object, but at the same time, our conception of wax is changes depending on its physical form uh, altering. So Meloponti is sort of saying that wax is both an abstract phenomenon as much as it is a physical object. To make this slightly clearer, because this is quite a difficult point to get your head around, uh, he wrote the following. So I cannot see the wax as it really is with my own eyes. The reality of the wax can only be conceived in the intellect. When I assume I am seeing the wax, all I am really doing is thinking back from the properties which appear before my senses to the wax in its naked reality. The wax which, through it lacks properties in itself, is nonetheless the source of all the properties which manifest themselves to me. Thus for Descartes, and this idea has held sway in the French philosophical tradition, perception is no more than the confused beginnings of scientific knowledge. The relationship between perception and scientific knowledge is one of appearance to reality. It befits our human dignity to entrust ourselves to the intellect, which alone can reveal to us the reality of the world. So there is a clear distinction between what Ponty believes about how we can attain knowledge about reality and in reality versus what Descartes believed, which is that it's uh, unattainable in a sense. Whereas Ponty here is saying that we can intellectually have an idea of what lies in reality. He ends this lecture by writing the following. The physics of relativity confirms the absolute and final objectivity is a mere dream by showing how each particular observation is strictly linked to the location of the observer and cannot be abstracted from this particular situation. It also rejects the notion of an absolute observer. We can no longer flatter ourselves with the idea that in science, the exercise of a pure and unsituated intellect can allow us to gain access to an object free of all human traces, just as God would see it. This does not make the need for scientific research any less pressing. In fact, the only thing under attack is the dogmatism of a science that thinks itself capable of absolute and complete knowledge. We are simply doing justice to each of the variety of elements in human experience, and in particular, to sensory perception. I do agree with Meloponti on this point, and I've talked about the optimism of science that many scientists have um, they have this almost scientism view, which some of you will be familiar with already, which is the idea that science can ultimately explain everything um, and that we don't need any external kind of sources of knowledge, right? And I do think that there is more to reality than what we can materially analyse and consistently analyse about reality, right? You know, consciousness, for example, can't be demonstrated using the scientific method to begin with. So science, as well as this, relies on itself being valid. It relies on our mental faculties working properly in order for it to be valid. So with a few things like these pointed out, Ponty clearly understands that science is in some regard self-defeating because it can't prove itself to be true using the scientific method, right? So 
this is a very problematic uh, thing for science. And it's very important to realise this because it ultimately implies that we should be looking elsewhere for truth, not only in the scientific method and what that has to offer us. Lecture two, exploring the world of perception, space. Malou Ponty begins this lecture by pointing out Malou Ponty begins this lecture by discussing Newtonian physics and how there is a difference between perceived space and absolute space. Thus, space is composed of a variety of different regions and dimensions, which can no longer be thought of as interchangeable and which affect certain changes in the bodies which move around within them. Instead of a world in which the distinction between identity and change is clearly defined, with each being attributed to a different principle, we have a world in which objects cannot be considered to be entirely self-identical, one in which it seems as though form and content are mixed, the boundary between them blurred. Such a world lacks the rigid framework by the uniform space of a usage. We can no longer draw an absolute distinction between space and the things which occupy it, nor indeed between the pure idea of space and the concrete spectacle it presents to our senses. To clarify, Malou Ponty is not talking about the space in terms of cosmology, but he's talking about space in perception, right? And so there is an absolute sense of space and a perceived sense of space. And he draws this distinction by again, going to his phenomenology of perception, there is the body and there is the mind, and both are required to interpret the world. Malou Ponty then compares this idea of absolute versus perceived space to the world of classical art, uh, particularly in, in the Renaissance, where the painter would design their work as if it was a gaze into infinity when you looked into the piece, into the into the art. In other words, the representation shown by the artist of what they are trying to create on the canvas is at a distance perceptually and psychologically from the viewer. So the painting is supposed to be at a distance by definition from the viewer. And there are many examples of this and I'll show some on the screen uh, right now. Malou-Ponty elaborates on this idea by writing the following. Thus, space is no longer a medium of simultaneous objects capable of being apprehended by an absolute observer who is equally close to them all. A medium without point of view, without body and without spatial position. In sum, the medium of pure intellect. As Jean Paulhan remarked recently, the space of modern painting is space which the heart feels space in which we are too located, space which is close to us and with which we are organically connected. Malou Ponty, lastly for this lecture, references Melbranch, who famously uh, designed an optical illusion of the moon. And Malou Ponty uses this to, as I mentioned earlier rather briefly, to make the point that the mind and body are required to perceive the world as we know it. And so they are not separate from one another, but actually they are required in unison to perceive the world. The introduction has a very succinct way of putting this point. Still, his general point is right. The space of the perceived world is not the unique space of a disembodied intellect, but like physical space has different regions which are structured by our expectations concerning the things which we find in them. Lecture three. Exploring the world of perception, sensory objects. Malou Ponty opens this lecture by saying that now he is going to discuss what is in perceived space rather than discussing what space is in of itself. Further from this, he points out that he is in opposition with anyone who claims that the perceiver does not have any kind of substantial relationship with the objects in reality that we perceive. Like with the example of wax from the previous lecture, Malou Ponty points out that honey is a good example of a substance which you can intellectualize, you can understand what honey is as a food, you can uh, be told of its substance, of its, of its texture, but really to know honey, you need to experience it. You can't just intellectualize what honey is, you really need to fully understand it, 
you need to uh, feel it in your hand, you need to feel how it runs away from you, but it also comes back as well. The substance in itself needs to be experienced to be understood rather than to be conceptualized abstractly. In a nutshell, this lecture is dedicated to the idea that we not only need to experience an object in reality in the perceived world to really know what it is, or at least to come close to knowing what it is, but we conceptualize and name things like foods dependent on our subjective experience with them. So the words we use, the very uh, semantics, the very vocabulary we use is also a relationship to our experience of that particular object that we are perceiving, such as honey. Admittedly, this section really had me scratching my head. This was a particularly hard lecture to understand, just because there's a lot of abstract words being used. Uh, Louis Ponty is at his finest when he is writing in that way. He was practically like that the entire time in Phenomenology of Perception, which he uh, does follow up on you know, many of these points. So again, if you're interested in these kind of ideas, then I would recommend Phenomenology of Perception. That is his magnum opus, so to speak. Uh, that is his book, uh, his Bible, the Ponti Bible. So I would really recommend that. If you have read this book and you understood this lecture perhaps more than me, what did you think of what he was saying? Uh, have you got an alternate interpretation? Uh, is there any way you could elaborate on this idea? So yeah, please let me know. Uh, I will, for now, put this lecture behind us and let's go forward to the next one. Exploring the world of perception, animal life. Malou Ponty opens this lecture by rather strongly pointing out that our relationship with the perceived world is enigmatically anthropomorphic. In other words, we perceive our reality through the lens of the advanced apes that we really are. We see ourselves in uh, rivers, we have dreams, vivid dreams of others, we have amazing uh, facial recognition systems in our brain. We perceive reality and ultimately see ourselves in the reflection. We are uh, focused on ourselves, our kind. It is our nature to find meaning where there is none. Following from this rather mind-bending analysis of human beings and how we love to see ourselves and that we are uh, enigmatic and uh, we, we anthropomorphize everything we, we interact with, such as you know, dogs, we, we love animals, for example, which faces resemble our own, whereas animals, uh, you know, bugs, for example, that don't, we have a bias to uh, not enjoy their company or, or to not really be bothered about them at all, just because they don't represent uh, us as humans. He circles back to Descartes in referencing his view on animals, which for those who know already, you will be uh, remembering such a horrible insight into history. But essentially Descartes' view on animals at the time was that they cannot feel pain, they are mere machines. And so what that led to historically is individuals following Descartes' philosophy and in some cases uh, harming animals and doing experiments on them because they believed at the time that they weren't causing them any pain. They showed pain through their expressions and shrieks or whatever, but at the time they were like, well, Descartes, the ultimate philosopher, I think therefore I am guy, they were like, well, I guess he's right. Like, it looks like they feel pain, but they're just mechanical machines who uh, simulate pain like humans do, but they actually genuinely do feel pain. And so they believe that animals don't feel anything at all. And so it was okay to experiment on them because there was no kind of moral or ethical repercussion, essentially. As well as referencing Voltaire at this same time, he kind of draws together this idea that Historically, and he uses the word primitive man, which isn't too politically correct for nowadays, I suppose, but he draws on the point that, you know, even people like Voltaire and Descartes, they had these really dangerous and jarring ideas at the time, right? And they were deemed to be the intellectuals, the uh, pinnacle of uh, rationality. And so Willy Ponty kind of explains that really historically, and even Voltaire says this in one of his entries, he's like, well, let's not really bother about listening to anyone else. You know, let's not look at animals and what they might perceive or what they might think. Let's not look at women, even though Milo Ponty doesn't reference women's conception and treatment in the past, but that might be just because he's numbed from World War II. Um, I won't go into that, but Milo Ponty points out that there are groups of human beings, individuals and animals for this matter, who have been disregarded merely because of their 
mental capacity, their faculties being underestimated, essentially. Whereas we know that many animals are incredibly intelligent and, you know, a discussion doesn't even ha need to be had about women. I mean, they are sometimes more intelligent than men, just in different ways. You know, it's uh, so Malou Ponty really makes a great point here. And it's quite ahead of time as well, because he's saying we need to basically take animals more seriously. We need to take these minorities more seriously in society who beforehand were not seen as the rational individuals, right? Uh, back then it was like the white man who was seen as uh, the most important and we should listen to the white men. But Malou Ponty, again, he's, he's ahead of his time here. He's saying, we need to quit this, right? We, we need to ask people what they think in these minorities. And we need to treat animals far better than we historically have because as he also points out in this lecture a tiny bit, animals do have impressive capacities and faculties which need to be taken seriously. And, you know, as somebody who is really involved in the animal ethics side of uh, philosophy, I was really happy with this analysis. I was like, you go, Molo Ponti. I, I love that. So, yeah, um, this lecture is primarily dedicated towards minorities who have something to say or you know animals where they have impressive faculties but they just haven't been paid attention to so he's kind of he's kind of voting for the underdogs here which which i found to be really surprising i suppose and really refreshing lecture five man seen from the outside in the beginning of this lecture malou ponty questions where anger for example comes from it comes from the expressions the physical behavior the tone of voice, right? It comes from the agitation somebody might have when they when, when they reply and they might stutter, right? So there are physical expressions of what uh, anger, for example, is. And that's how we kind of come to understand and interpret anger as an emotion. In other words, this is a plain example, according to Malibonti, where the body can offer us many different answers about uh, reality as it is, but we also have to consult the mind and understand the psychology of individuals to come to conclusions about what we perceive in reality. It follows on from this analysing uh, the psychology of children, uh, child development, and how children are taught how to feel in some regard by looking at their elders or, or those around them, right? I mean, keeping with the example of anger, which Malou Ponty uh, has throughout the lecture, children are taught anger from their parents' own anger, right? They are taught the particular expressions that they would make, they are taught the kind of tone that matches the feeling of anger or the manifestation of anger. And so Malone Ponty is kind of drawing upon some Piaget ideas, you know, like how children perceive the world and how the world perceives children and how it's kind of a two-way street where children learn from what they observe, but also there's the observation appealing at the same time to them. And his central idea here is that we only understand ourselves through perceiving others. And put in a different form, our behaviour is manifested by the same perception that we have of others in the external world. He then goes on to assess humankind's vices and virtues, uh, the good and bad of humanity, and he kind of takes this existentialist, absurdist approach to kind of going forward from this point. I think it's best if I just read you out what he concluded with at the last paragraph of the lecture. To look at human beings from the outside is what makes the mind self-critical and keeps it sane. But the aim should not be to suggest that all is absurd, as Voltaire did. It is much more a question of implying, as Kafka does, that human life is always under threat and of using humour to prepare the ground for those rare and precious moments at which human beings come to recognise, to find one another. Lecture 6. Art and the World of Perception. Malou Ponty once again circles back to art and how by perceiving and interpreting and understanding artistic pieces and even the artists behind them and what their intentions are, what the design is of their work, we can understand how we ought to perceive the world. Reciprocally then, having learnt that the things of the perceived world are manifest to us in experience and not substances hidden behind a veil of appearances, he wants us to see that much the same is true of works of art. Their meaning is what is given in our experience of them. 
it does not reside in their relationship to something else, something not perceived, but represented. Lou Ponty elaborates on this quite extensively, which I want to share a few uh, various sentences from uh, three or so pages, and I'm going to put them together just to make it as clear as possible what he was trying to uh, say in, in this lecture. So painting does not imitate the world, but is a world of its own. This means that in our encounter with a painting, at no stage are we sent back to the natural object. Similarly, when we experience a portrait aesthetically, its resemblance to the model is of no importance. Those who commission portraits often want them to be good likeness, but this is because their vanity is greater than their love of painting. Suffice it is to say that even when painters are working with real objects, their aim is to never evoke the object itself, but to create on the canvas a spectacle which is sufficient unto itself. So in the presence of a painting, it is not a question of my making ever more references to the subject, to the historical event, if there is one, which gave rise to the painting, rather as is in the perception of things themselves, it is a matter of contemplating, of perceiving the painting by way of the silent signals which come at me from its every part, which emanate from the traces of paint set down on the canvas until such as all, in the absence of reason and discourse, come to form a tightly structured arrangement in which one has the distinct feeling that nothing is arbitrary, even if one is unable to give a rational explanation of this. He doesn't only draw upon artistic pieces, you know, uh, Renaissance paintings. He talks about film, he talks about music, he talks about mediums that we perceive and that we enjoy and that we gather, most importantly, what we gather meaning and representation from. And so Merleau Ponty's entire point in this lecture, to conclude, is the idea that to understand the world and to perceive the world more richly, right, to interpret what we see in reality more succinctly and to even understand those interpretations better, it is preferable to look further into what reality entails, to watch films, to uh, you know read literature, which is something he also uh, discusses, to also listen to music. These are the things we can do to enrich our perception of the world and to philosophically understand who we are as, uh, as a consequence of that. Lecture seven, classical world modern world. In this final lecture, Malou Ponty begins to explain how in the ancient world it was believed that eventually we would come to profoundly and completely understand reality as it appears to us. But Malou Ponty describes this as a false optimism. That whilst we can understand things about reality more than what Descartes believed, as far as Malou Ponty is concerned, we can't be so sure that we will understand everything. And if we think about what he was saying previously about scientism, this still exists, right? People still believe that the world as we know it can be fully understood. But that is a contradiction in terms of us not even understanding the origin of who we are, what we came from, what consciousness is, you know? We are still struggling to find out those fundamental axiomatic questions. So without understanding the a priori, right, of our existence as uh, phenomenology generally tries to um, understand and to uh, interpret without even knowing that much how can we try and dream of having this holistic understanding of reality using let's say science this kind of optimism as i mentioned earlier to malu ponty is uh, misleading it is it is perhaps even false to use his own words we are trapped in perpetual ambiguity Malou Ponty discusses a truth of all time in which he relates the death of God as Nietzsche prophesized to perhaps even the death of reason. And even the introduction outlines that perhaps the death of God and the death of reason are the same thing. Because society, as Nietzsche uh, proclaimed in The Gay Science and many of his other books, he understood the consequence of an objective morality not existing and what that might mean for the future of hum humankind. If we can't ground our morals in anything substantial, right? If the foundation we, we, we stand on is a sandcastle, and as soon as we plant our feet firmly in it, if it crumbles beneath us, what are we left with? We are left with ourselves 
to then pick up the pieces and make our own truths, our own meanings. And this highlights what Ponty ends the book on, ends the lectures on, which is this postmodern idea where there could be a truth of all time. But even the introduction points out, and I agree, that this is kind of counterintuitive to what Ponty is saying throughout the piece, because he's saying, look, this holistic perspective of truth, um, this idea that we can have a fully attainable idea of reality, because on one hand, as he previously said, this idea, this, this optimism of uh, scientism, this optimism that we can understand reality from a holistic perspective, from pointing out that this is misleading and false optimism, he then comes on to say that there could be a truth of all time and that we uh, should even have a preference for that, which is why it's a bit of a postmodern conundrum. And so the introduction points this out too. It does seem to be a slight contradiction on Malou Ponty's part. In other words, it's similar to my sandcastle example, where there's no foundation to stand on. It will just crumble beneath you. Well, Malou Ponty's point kind of is jumping from a ledge onto nothingness. He doesn't exactly seem uh, objective about this, this point. He doesn't seem to have all the answers, but he does believe that there is a ledge, right? He does believe that there's something there, whereas the implications of what he said and also Nietzsche's prophecies Nietzsche would disagree. There, there isn't one at all, right? But of course, Malou Ponty is saying we have to, at the fundamental level, make our own truths. But with the death of God, reason might be the end of, of that opportunity as well. With the death of God, it's the end of reason to some extent. Now, that is a very complicated thesis. It's, it's a really in-depth, uh, dense lecture. But I think that, you know, I, I think that you guys would, would benefit from, you know, analysing yourself in, in the book. What did you think of these lectures? Did you, did you find them you know, really interesting? Which ones did you like more than others? What are your thoughts on one or two or, you know, any that you uh, were scratching your head up maybe or, or anything that you would perhaps correct me on or, or correct the introduction on some of what I read out of there? Give me your thoughts in the comment section below. So for those who are still watching this video, which... Thank you, by the way. I, I really appreciate it. I, I did spend uh, quite a lot of time, you know, writing up all my thoughts and and compiling this video. I, I really wanted to take it seriously. I, I really wanted to indulge myself in Malou Ponty's writings, in his ideas, because I really think that he's an underrated thinker. And phenomenology as a subject, I feel, is underrated. Like, it's a really, really important subject. Like, you know, what is consciousness? What is perceived space, like how do we even come to uh, have, have claims to knowledge and how, how do we come to know reality? Like what what are the a priori's here? Because one thing that Malou Ponty criticizes in Phenomenology of Perception is this idea that whilst science presupposes knowledge, presupposes our mental faculties to be consistent, Malou Ponty is like, hey look, let's not go that far yet. Let's just actually find out whether we're not a walking contradiction, in other words. Like, let's find out how reliable our faculties are. Let's find out how we ought to perceive the world and how the world is perceived and and, and how it's interpreting us as a, as a consequence of it existing between the mind and the body. So Malou Ponty really does elaborate on many of these ideas in his magnum opus, The Phenomenology of Perception. Uh, that, that word phenomenology, it's, it's, you know, it's sometimes pretty hard to get right. I mean, half the time I'm like, full of phenomenology, yeah. Anyway, so I hope you guys really enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you enjoyed it, of course, and share to anyone or any groups that you think would be interested in the contents of this piece. Uh, phenomenology is just such an interesting topic. And as you guys will know from my update video recently, um, it's the subject I'm going to be studying for the next few months because, as well as other things, but it's uh, for my research project, I'm going to probably be studying near-death experiences and uh, using a phenomenological uh, method, which is IPA, Interpretive Phenomenological Analysis. So yeah, I'm really going in depth with this kind of literature at the moment. If there's any other books which are similar to this, which you would recommend to me, I'm all open for it. And I do have my Patreon, which if you want to help me out, you know, continue running my channel and you know help a bit get help me get 
special equipment or just support me in general uh, that would be very much appreciated it's all in the link below uh yeah anyway this has been a very in-depth video so again I, I really hope you enjoyed uh what i what i've had to offer and let me know if you're going to pick up the book so thank you for watching guys and i'll see you soon